a distinct pleasure to introduce Karen Wright officially. Uh, Karen is our speaker today. Karen is the president, co-founder, and executive director of the Greater Contribution, also known as TGC, a 501c3 all-volunteer nonprofit based in Thousand Oaks. She is a passionate advocate for the poor and a frequent speaker in the fight against poverty. In 2006, Karen and her co-founders were motivated by recognition of the abundance of their own lives and a desire to make a greater contribution, to give back and to make a difference in the lives of those who are so much less fortunate. They formed the Greater Contribution. In 2009, Karen was given national recognition with a Vibrant Giver Award for her dedication to poverty relief worldwide and for helping to change the world for the better. She was nominated the same year by the LA Business Journal for their Women Making a Difference Award as a Nonprofit Leader of the Year. She was also one of the featured speakers at the TED Conference in Thousand Oaks in 2010. She travels to Africa every six months to monitor the TGC loan program there. Since 2008, under Karen's leadership, the Greater Contribution has provided over 9,000 microloans to women living in abject poverty, allowing them to start small businesses and to begin to work their way out of poverty benefiting 45,000 people. It's my pleasure to welcome Ms. Karen. Thank you so much. Um, it really is lovely to be with you. I resonated so much with what Danielle had to say. It's that beautiful spirit of service above self, and I just applaud you for that. Um, and that's really largely what the greater contribution is about. We, as uh, Linda said it was started by myself and a couple of women who wanted to make a greater contribution and um, a mentor of mine once said if it is to be it's up to me and I, yeah see a lot of heads nodding yeah that's how we all work that's how we all uh, do this so let me tell you just a little bit uh, about the organization our work is focused specifically on helping women work their way out of poverty. And this is a typical group that we would loan to. We loan to women in groups of 20. Um, as Linda said, we're a local 501c3. We're all volunteer. We pay no wages here. Everyone volunteers more than four minutes a day. <laughs> and. Uh, we uh, work to fight against poverty, and we're interested in a long-term solution to poverty. So when we all started this, we shared a common experience that maybe you've had, where there is an earthquake or a tsunami or some kind of terrible natural disaster, and we know that people need immediate emergency aid. And you send in your money, and then pretty soon you hear, you know what? All that aid is sitting in an airport somewhere, or at a dock, or some government official has hijacked it. And I had that experience so often I just felt sick about it, because I want to make a difference with the money and the time I give, as you all do. So that was part of um, the founding of the Greater Contribution. And so we work with village level hubs our pledge from the beginning to work was to work with the poorest of the poor. And so that means in Africa, in remote villages, not the cities, there are more resources in the cities, but we wanted to go to the villages where there are fewer microloan programs and aid programs. And we provide capital training and support uh, services. And the idea is to make this sustainable over time. So we give the loans specifically for women to start small businesses that are sustainable. And we give them a lot of business training because many of them for years have been selling things. But as you all know, selling is not the same thing as running a business. So we give them business training skills. We have mentors that work with them once a month, one-on-one. -on -one. They come into our loan center every two weeks to repay their loans and they get many lessons as well as some shared learning at that time. So the idea is to really give them skills to work their way out of poverty, not just the money, because the money alone won't do it. Uh, we work in, right now, we're primarily working in this little tiny country of Uganda right here, 
As you can see, it's landlocked, so that presents some uh, economic development challenges of its own. Another challenge is that it's about the same size as the state of Oregon. And you may know that the state of Oregon has about 6 million people, but Uganda has 37 million oh people. God. When I'm there, it's like, you know the feeling when you go to a football game or something, these masses of people? It's like that all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's crowded. Um, so what's the opportunity? Well, I started this organization because I had read this book by Jeffrey Sachs, The End of Poverty. And I'm almost embarrassed to admit it, but as an adult, I thought poverty was here to stay. I thought it was terrible, but I thought it was part of the human condition. And the terrible part is that he, as he quotes, 20,000 people a day perished of extreme poverty, and it's of preventable causes of poverty, preventable. And most of those 20,000 deaths are children under the age of five. That's what just killed you. But the other thing he said that was so powerful to me is this, this last sentence. The end of extreme poverty is at hand within our generation, but only if we grasp the opportunity in front of us. And so I just said, I'm going to do something about this. And three of my friends said, OK, we're with you. And what are you doing? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> so we sat around my kitchen table. There was a lot of silence for a while. And eventually, we learned about this little magical tool called the microloan. So a little bit more about the need, though. Almost half of the world's population lives on less than $2 a day. And the truth is, they don't live on it. They die on that. You know? Most of the women that we support live uh, on less than $1.25 a day. The UN defines that as extreme poverty. And 75% of all people living in poverty are women or girls. And a lot of it, you can probably figure out the reasons. Women, girls, are less educated than men, so they have less opportunity. And they also get married sooner. They have children sooner. So they're disadvantaged in many, many ways. About 900 million people live in slum-like conditions without access to clean water and sanitation. And as you can read, 150 million primary school-aged children are not in school. That means they're stuck in that awful cycle of poverty. They can't get out because they have no means to earn a better living. So this is what it looks like. What does this poverty look like when you're there? What do you see? This is a typical house. You can see it's made out of mud and sticks with uh, palm fronds as a roof. Uh, or it looks like this. And you know, the first time I went to Africa, I had this funny experience. I get there, the flight I always take now gets there very late at night. So I get there late at night, go to the hotel, get up in the morning, and I say to myself, okay, well, this hotel is good enough, but it's in a really bad part of town. And then I learned there is no good part of town and bad part of town. The poverty is so pervasive that it's like that everywhere. In this country, we have bad neighborhoods, right? We have neighborhoods you don't want to go to late at night. It's a constant all over most of Africa. This is what a kitchen looks like. This is Ida, one of our borrowers, and she's actually from the northern part of Uganda where they've had civil war and a lot of the people there were displaced, so she moved to the south. And so she doesn't have any inherited land like most Ugandans do. So she rents this house, and when she's late with her rent, they lock her and her six children out, and they're out on the street. So, as I've said, the people we serve are in the remote villages of Uganda. They have no access to um, financial services provided by some of the big microloan companies. Banks won't have anything to do with them. 
99% uh, are living uh, in very extreme poverty. Basic services, uh, the infrastructure in Uganda is so poor that uh, only about 4% have electricity. 61% um, of our borrowers' main source of water is an open pipe, a pipe that runs through the street, but it's cracked, and so dirt and feces get into the water supply and, of course, lots of disease as a result. Almost 82% of the households have one member who's regularly sick. It just rotates among the family. People regularly get malaria, regularly get cholera. Uh, so the life expectancy is 47 years in Uganda. Yeah. So people ask, why do we loan to women? Don't you like men? Are you a raging feminist? <laughs> or what's the, what's the reason? Well. 75% of all those people living in poverty are women. And then secondly, there have been numerous studies done, and what they see is that women are three to four times more likely to invest any money they get in the family or in a business. Whereas particularly in Uganda, men will spend it on alcohol, prostitution, drugs, even though their children may be sitting at home and can't eat. So it just makes sense. Um, in addition, women are expected to be the breadwinners. It's, I know, what a deal, huh? <laughs> you know? Yeah, you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, and the interesting thing is that once a woman gets a business going and it's successful and it's bringing in money, the men go, hey, what a deal, and they get on board, and they help, and they go buy inventory, and they do all kinds of things. So it actually then becomes a family project. Older children will help in the businesses, so it really uh, strengthens the family ties. I, I was just there, I just got back on Wednesday. One of our groups uh, told me that several of the women, when they come in to make their loan repayments, are bringing their husbands with them. And I said, why are they bringing them? And they said, well, actually the husbands are insisting on coming because they want to show that they're supporting their wives. So, yeah, pretty yeah. happy about that, yeah. Um, so, I don't know if you're all familiar with microloans, but they are in the sense of micro, they're small, small to us, but big for uh, women in Uganda, uh, 50 to $175. We loan in groups of 20 because there's great solidarity among these groups. The women support each other, they help each other, and they're required to cross-guarantee the loans. So if one woman is in trouble, and they know they're going to have to repay her loan or one of her loan payments, they jump in and find ways to support her and help her with her business so that she's successful, so that she can make those loan payments. And it's quite touching, actually. We've seen women who got very sick, and women would go to her place of business and run the business for her, and it's really quite sweet. Uh, the loans are repaid every six months and loaned out again. So it's a revolving loan fund. So anyone who donates, say, 50 or or $100, it gets loaned out over and over and over again. It's really, it's really a sweet system. Uh, so here are some of our borrowers receiving loans. <laughs> this woman was quite ecstatic. She was dancing and yelling, and she was something else. Uh, we're always greeted like rock stars, I tell you, it's, it's something else. They really are appreciative and grateful and sweet, sweet people. Yeah. Uh, so how do they use the loans? As I said, they're, we're out in rural villages, so the loans are primarily used to create businesses that are basic necessities of life. Food items, clothing, uh, shoes. Um, charcoal, which they use as a cooking fuel, sometimes um, uh, firewood as well, um, seeds, jewelry, any of the ladies familiar with the paper beads that Africans make, like these? Yeah, we have several women who make those. 
and they begin small with one or two products and then they increase a business just like anyone running a business here start small and build so uh, this is a first-time borrower and she has stocks of bananas that's her whole business when she feels confident that she can do this she can run a business she can repay a loan because by the way in this culture the women are typically told they're stupid they're useless they have their confidence is zero so it takes a while for them to actually believe they can do this. And then they may get something like this, where now instead of just bananas, they have lettuce, tomatoes, onions, and so on. And then this I call the Ugandan 7-Eleven <laughs> because, <laughs> as you can see, you can get anything in this store. Anything you can get in the 7-Eleven here, you can get in this store, including flip-flops, by the way, a big item over there. And you can see this is uh, uh, the woman on the right, her name is Agnes, and this is her husband who, as I mentioned before, now he's involved. He's helping to run the business. And this is quite a big expansion for them. But the really thrilling part for me is when we go back and we see that they're employing other people in their business. So it's really capitalism at its best. <laughs> you know, it starts really small. Uh, we went to this uh, they call it uh, a tailor. Here we would call a woman a seamstress. They call them tailors. So we go to see this borrower and she's not there. Where is she? She's off in Kampala buying supplies. And these are her two employees, these two men. And it was sort of funny because, as you can imagine, as white women there, we're, we're called Mazungus, we attract a lot of attention. It's like, who's that? and these guys could care less. They were working. They hardly looked up. They said, she's in Kampala, kept working. It was very interesting, very industrious. Uh, this is me with a woman named Alan, and this is her barn in back, and she's been with us about four years. She's a longtime borrower, and she started with some bags, great big bags of, they call them G-nuts, which are basically peanuts, in the back of her hut. And she kept expanding, kept expanding. And so now she has, uh, I think it's five cows and seven goats. And yeah, and that's a form of savings for them. Because one borrower described to me how she had, had bought so many pigs. One pig produced seven piglets. She was able to sell that to pay school fees for her children. So uh, livestock is a big deal. Alan was also the one who told me, she said, um, women, you'll, this will mean something to you. She said to me sort of sheepishly one time, I have a lot of income now, and now I own three skirts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so does it work? That's the important thing. Does it help people? Well, the women come into our program earning an average of about $37 a month in U.S. dollars, and 24 months later, they've had about a 400% increase in income. And it's, isn't it amazing? And it starts with this little tiny loan, little tiny loan, yeah. And we're happy and proud to say we have a 98% repayment rate. So I've heard bankers when I've talk to groups, bankers who go, <gasps> I'd love to have a 98% rate. And you know, it's so ironic because microloans started because conventional banks wouldn't loan to the poor. Many of you are shaking your heads, you know this. They said, no, the poor won't repay anything. They have no collateral, they have no credit history. You're crazy, they're not going to repay. They repay. Yeah. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, it's more than a loan. It's education, it's skills. So this is one of our uh, training sessions. And we also provide them with calculators, with budgeting uh, tools, with record keeping books so they can track how much they're buying, what they're selling it for, what their profit is, that kind of thing. Real simple um, record keeping, but ideas that they haven't been exposed to before. Um, and they want to learn. 
Oh, this is one of my favorite ladies. Her name is Sharifa. She loves to sew. She was trained as a tailor. She has a sewing machine, but until a year ago, she could only buy enough fabric to make one school uniform at a time. School uniforms were her thing. And so last January, a year ago, we gave her a micro loan, and within two months, she had a contract for a school to make uniforms for an entire school within two months. Okay, so now I was just there, as I said, and our loan administrator said, Sharifa wants to come and see you. Great, you know, so she comes and she tells me she now has contracts with three schools, and she sews in this little uh, courtyard of the village um, because she has no windows or electricity in her house, so she needs the sunlight. But now she's got several women in the village sewing on buttons and cutting and doing various things, so she's got a little mini assembly line going. So it's really neat, it's very exciting. So what do they do with the money when they have a successful business? One of the first things is nutritious meals. So we do a lot of surveying, a lot of data collection with the women that we give loans to. And very often, the poorest of the poor, they're eating one meal a day. Sometimes the mother is eating one meal so the children can have two. But as they get meals, uh, as they get their businesses going, uh, pretty soon we see on their applications the whole family is eating three meals a day, which is just great. Um, they have uh, access to medical care now. So um, to give you an idea, m one of the board members traveled with me on this recent trip. And while she was there, she injured her knee, it swelled up and so on. So we Skyped her doctor at home. The doctor said, you need prednisone. So our loan office is right next to a clinic. So we said, well, let's go see if they have any prednisone. So lo and behold, we got lucky. <laughs> they had prednisone. She got uh, 40 tablets for $2.09. I know, but even that for Ugandan can be out of reach sometimes. So once they have a, a loan and a viable business, they can provide for their own medical care. Um, they also can pay school fees. Um, you know, in many countries of sub-Saharan Africa, school is not free. Um, the government may set up the school structure, but they still have to pay tuition, uniforms, they have to buy their own books, they have to buy their own pencils and all of that. So that's always a high priority for the women. They all want their children to be able to go to school. If they don't have a good income, maybe they can send one of their children to school or two, but not all of them. So they want to get all of their kids in school. And then they increase their inventory, as I've shown you. They'll grow their little businesses. And then they improve their uh, housing. You saw some of these mud and stick huts. Um, if they have a severe rainy season, sometimes those get completely washed away and they have to rebuild. So um, when they really do well, they'll build a brick house. They call it a permanent house, a brick house. Or sometimes they'll simply add a cement floor so that they have less disease as opposed to sleeping on mud. Yeah. So a little bit about us, brag a little bit. We're very efficient. As I said, no one here gets paid anything. Um, so we have 92% of our resources go to programs and the other 8% is spent on keeping a website up, <laughs> on insurance for our board members, um, mat uh, printed materials, that kind of thing. Uh, we're independent, non-sectarian, non-governmental, and as I said, we're working to help women lift themselves up. These are loans that get repaid, they aren't handouts. So, Mohammed Yunus was the founder, the inventor of this idea of a microloan. And he said, he said this.
this has become our slogan. And it really is an opportunity to take a very small amount of money and to do something really extraordinary with it. It truly changes lives in a very dramatic way. Um, so, questions? Yes, sir. Uh, just to get one comment. Rotary is very fond of microphones also. It's one of our areas of focus. So mm -hmm. it ties into our thinking also. But what was Sachs talking about when he talked about historic opportunity? Is he talking about something specific to our time now that, that creates an opportunity? Well, he's talking... Uh, it's a magnificent book. If you're a reader, take a look. Um, what he is saying is that we live in a time of such wealth. We don't see it. We don't think we're wealthy. But believe me, we're the royalty of the world. We've won the economic lottery of the world. And if we can get the will to do something about this, it can be solved. And it's very interesting to me. I've been doing this since 2006. And I see groups all over the world small groups like mine doing their own little bit. And Rotary, uh, when I go to Uganda, I stay in a city called Mbale. There's a Rotary club there that's been there for 50 years. And I actually did a project. We funded some microloans for the, uh, the Rotary's program director's home village. <laughs> um, and Rotary, there are Rotary clubs everywhere. You were talking about Japan and Thailand. Uh, these, even in countries where it's really poor and these people don't have a lot of money, they're like you and me here, and they're doing the same kind of things that you're doing. They're out there trying to help the disadvantaged in their communities. What's your website? It is www.greatercontribution.org. And actually, I can now take these cards out that we're holding <laughs> the projector. And there's a website that's on the back. Okay. Do you use them for the platform for the investing, or do you uh, manage it all yourself? We manage it all ourselves. And we, um, we have a group called Partners in Prosperity. People who uh, people who donate twenty dollars a month, and for that twenty dollars a month, you turn a family's life around with a micro loan. Yeah, yeah, Sarah. First of all, yeah, Karen, I want to commend you for this wonderful project that you oh. initiated. It's just amazing Thank how you. far you've come with just a little group who's who's a vol just voluntary and. Um, you mentioned an unintended um, outcome of the husband who are coming to Silk the Right. Have you seen anything else? Because you're actually creating like an infrastructure for these villages. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I see other things happening. Mm -hmm. Can you think of any other things? Oh, I've got a list a mile long. Right? Yeah. amazing to me. Yeah, one of the main things that I want to work on is a literacy program. Yeah. Because we have women who tell me, for example, they have a loved one in the hospital and they go there to see them and the doctor says, go to room eight. They can't read. They don't know what an eight looks like even. Um, so literacy is one of the things I want to work on with them. That's huge because that keeps people behind. I want to work on some time management for some of our people. Um, I just took with me a technology person and we worked on some technology issues in the village where we've headquartered we installed Dropbox which she accidentally erased uh, so we <laughs> just you know they aren't used to technology um, things like I saw one of the calculators but mm -hmm. did you yeah. have any math skills or did you have those are for the literate ladies yeah. yeah we provide them with calculators and they're solar so they can use them in their business calculations. Yeah. Awesome job, Karen. Oh, thank I you. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, are there, what is your relationship with the government? Ah, uh, well, I try to avoid the government <laughs> at all costs. Yeah. I don't even want the government to know we're there. Oh, okay. 
also, the government is uh, a dictatorship, a man named Museveni, who's been in power since 1985. And um, so, the structure that we work with, uh, these groups that I mentioned, they're called CBOs, community-based organizations, and they're actually licensed with the government. And then we have a side agreement with them. They open a bank account, we wire money directly into that bank account so that it never gets near the government. Uh, and we monitor it, I get their statements online, um, they have uh, balance sheets they have to send us. They have to send us deposit receipts every two weeks for the money that's deposited. Um, but we just kind of operate under the, the under the radar. Yeah. Earlier we were talking about laptops. Mm -hmm. What about tablets? Are those as necessary for you as laptops? Um, they're not necessary. Well, no, because most tablets are touch screen or they're, w I actually have a tablet that's Windows 8.1 that's too advanced for them. Okay. They're still learning basic computer skills. Yeah. But anyone who has used laptops that are recent and in good condition, I'd love to have you donate them. Yes. Um, so we see what they what they sell, significant things they sell. Who do they sell to? Because they they must go outside their area or somewhere where there's income where they can Yeah. Contain, yeah. So right. Is that what they do? They they, they manufacture or well, they sell the some to each other, and then they have regional markets, you know, like we have a farmer's market, they have those that they'll go to. Um, the area we're working is really near the Kenyan border, sometimes they go over into Kenya, and we've actually started to have some traders from Kenya come in to buy products from our borrowers to take them. And, you know, bear in mind that in poverty, not everyone is exactly the same level. So there are people who can only afford the food products, and then there are a few people up above that who can afford to buy some used clothes and so on. Yeah. 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 How many, uh, have outstanding at any one time? And what's the dollar? How many, how many dollars go into loans that are outstanding? Well, we loan roughly sixty thousand dollars a year, and at and it's as I said, it's a rotating fund. So we tend to have about a thousand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, good for you. Wow. Oh, thank you very much. You're welcome.